the long lens, like basically I defined the notion of smooth representations of GLN and GLN as periodic group and defined the uh, notion of Vaudelin representations and stated the local long lens correspondence, which is now a theorem. So my today's lecture is introduction to Rapoport zinc spaces. So basically we want to, I mean, it's a geometric approach to the local long lens correspondence. If you want to establish it, then basically I mean, there are some ways, but I mean, this is the most successful and fruitful way to approach it. Although the local long lens correspondence itself doesn't have any reference to geometry. So let me explain I mean, where the idea comes from. So we call that um, the, the local long lens correspondence for GLN is where K is, well, finite extension of Q, P. Um, so we have this irreducible smooth representations, GLN K representations, and we have n-dimensional Vaudelin representations of the Vay group WK. Um, so the theorem is that there is a bijection satisfying many nice properties. Um, so the question, okay, how to establish? And last time I also ex tried to explain without giving precise definitions, the so-called supercospital representations and their irreducible representations. And basically, the idea I tried to convey was that I mean, there is an essential case you can prove, and then the general case basically follows from it. So well, in any case, so the geometric approach will basically give a precise uh, result in this direction, but anyhow, I mean, how can we get started? That's the question. Um, so at least you can think of t roughly two ways. Namely, first you sort of classify representations on each side and try to match So, I mean, they are probably too difficult to get your hands on. So, you, I mean, by classification, I mean, like, you parameterize this representation in terms of data that you can understand better. And you do that on each side. For instance, you can try to parameterize them with, like, one dimensional representations of certain objects, which are much easier, and then you can try to write down the classifying data here and classifying data here and try to match up. So that's one possibility, but, and that's actually fruitful to some extent, but no one has kind of completed the proof in this direction, although people could get some cases, like when n is, especially when n is prime to p. Um, but the second approach is, um, sort of geometric approach to so eventually it's a geometric approach but a priori let me just say that um, find a vector space a nice vector space such that it comes with commuting actions of the say GLNK and the Vey group, so that somehow this group action reflects the local long lens correspondence when they act on this vector space, right? I mean, that's sort of natural from the viewpoint of representation theory, because, I mean, after all, you, one, one of the best ways to understand the group is you just 
find the natural vector space on which they act. Right? And the idea is you find this nice vector space from geometry. Um, so how can you do that? Well, first of all, one observation or fact is that there's, well, in general, it's not easy to get a vector space on which Gawa group acts, but there's a kind of general machinery you can use, which is that um, the basically analytic et al. cohomology theory. The general machinery which associates to any geometric object. By geometric, I mean algebraic geometric object over field K. I mean, there's some, if you like, functor associating QL bar vector space to X and such that automatically comes with Galois action. Just because the at all column of the functor is functorial. So, because uh, that Galois group acts on here, right? So that's how it works. So, if you want a vector space with this variable batch and variable with almost the Galois group, so the idea is maybe you have to find some geometric object defined over K or something close to that. Um, so that's how you would get this action, but then how do you get GLNK action? Well, so you have to really find the <laughs> geometric object with GLNK symmetry. Um, so you find some geometric object over K with GLNK symmetry. and take a tau homology, then you will achieve this. But, well, but where, where do you find such a geometric object with large symmetry? Um, one natural way to do that is to use moduli space. I mean, to get any non-trivial example, you would use moduli space, parameterizing data which come with GLMK symmetry. So, for instance, if you use a moduli space for sort of n-dimensional objects, then GLN will just act on this moduli data, so it will act on the moduli space. So, so some, we will do something along this line. Um, and for us, this specifically, we will use Rappaport zinc spaces, and they turn out to be moduli space for Barcelona Tate groups, which I will introduce. So let's see. Um, in fact, a well, similar idea has been used to global long lens correspondence, and there you use kind of, I mean, you're interested in similar situation. You want to build a correspondence between representation of the global Gawa group and adalic GLN. And there, you again try to look at a moduli space, which are, which is like a modular curve or in general, Shimura varieties. So let me draw a table to summarize the situation. So. So you're interested in either local long lens or global long lens for GLN, possibly also for other groups. Um, so what do I want? Well, we want geometric object. And here we will basically look at Rappaport zinc spaces. And in the global case, you will look at Shimura varieties and take their et al. cohomology. And they, they are moduli spaces for partially tape groups. And in this case, uh, 
they parameterize abelian varieties. Abelian. Well, plus some additional structure like polarizations, endomorphisms, level structures, things like that. But so, and it turns out that the Barsudi tail groups are sort of local analogs of abelian varieties, just as Rapoport zinc spaces turn out to be local analogs of Shimura varieties. So everything works pretty well. And, and there's a group action on the cohomology of these guys. In this case, you will get some V group action, local V group. times, well, some GLN, or in general, some periodic group G. And actually, another periodic group will appear naturally, as I will explain. Some so that's what is going to happen in the end when we consider cohomology of this guy. And in the Shimura variety case, you will get some global Galois group times adelic group G, which defines the Shimura variety. So, so it's like local, global, local, global counterpart of each other. Um, so my goal today is basically make sense of the, this row. I'm not going to say anything about Shimura varieties, but I'll explain, well, what, first what partially tape groups are and how to define Rapoport zinc spaces as moduli spaces for partially tape groups. And I won't have much time, but I'll at least briefly indicate how you get this group action on the cohomology. So no. Yeah, that, that's a funny thing, but well, eventually, I mean, as a bonus, you will see something like lo local jacket lanterns correspondence between G and J, but I'll, I'll get to that, okay? Maybe only briefly at the end. Okay, so, um, good. So, Barsodi Tate groups. Mm. So let me give definition. By the way, I mean the basic references, Messing's lecture notes in mathematics. Uh, so, so consider scheme S, and the most interesting case is where P is important in S. For instance, A scheme such that P is nilpotent in S, although I mean, you don't need it to define this notion. So, a uh, Barsody Tate group over S is, well, it's, it's a sequence of group schemes. Um, so, well, let me say of height H, in fact. Um, H is an integer. <laughs> well, such that, uh, well, each sigma i is, well, finite commutative group scheme over S of locally free of height, a, free of rank. A P to the well. Let me write a M. I'll use I for something else. M H. Mm. And well, the I'll just write that sigma M is the kernel of the P to the M multiplication map of the next guy. Well, something like this. So I'll explain, but 
basically, so sigma one has is p torsion community of group scheme. Sigma two is like p squared torsion group scheme and p cubed torsion, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so let me quickly give examples of Barsody Tate groups. By the way, there is a synonym for this. Uh, it's also called p divisible groups. It's the, it means exactly the same thing. So um, yeah. So what are examples? There's so-called et al. p divisible group, constant et al. p divisible group, QP over ZP. In this case, you can basically confuse group scheme with const just abstract group. You can always associate a group scheme to an abstract group. So these are, these are constant group schemes. Ah. Uh, uh, I think it should be it should follow from this. Yeah. I mean, I think this implies that actually it is surjective. Yeah. Yeah. No? Like, if I, ah, oh, ah, oh, I think, yeah, something's strange. Yeah, it should be surjective onto sigma, sigma one. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, I think I wrote something. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. The, let me see. Yeah, it's uh, maybe I'll just put it as condition three. I think there's a simpler way, but uh, P on this system is subject onto. I think this comes down to something simpler on finite level, like you no, know, like <laughs> if P to, P to the M. For every, yeah, well, I think I, I can stay in the, at finite level, but let me be lazy and just say that multiplication by p is onto. Well, thanks for pointing out. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, well, when I say onto, in fact, and the easiest way to make sense of it is to view it as a shift rather than just group scheme. So onto in the sense of FPPF topology, but that's just a technical point. Okay, so the first example is QP mod ZP given by the following sequence, and you'll see that this guy has rank P, namely just a group of order P, order P squared, etc. So it will have Hide one and satisfies all these properties. For instance, multiplication by p is onto in here. You can easily see. Or you can consider mu p infinity, where mu p m is just the group scheme defined by x of p to the m equals one. By this equation, there is a group scheme defined and, well, you get another height one partially take groups. And for a large class of examples, you can consider abelian scheme, a family of abelian varieties over S, then you can produce easily a partially take group by taking p torsion subgroup scheme, p square torsion subgroup scheme, etc., and then just connect them with the natural injection, then you will get the partially take group. And if it has dimension g, then this guy will have height 2g. And for instance, when a is an 
ordinary elliptic curve, then you will have basically something like QP mod ZP times mu P infinity as the associated Barsotti tape group. Oh, well, it's a high, just definition. It's a sort of a notion of rank or dimension. But there is a, a dimension means actually something else. So I mean, we just say it's height. But I mean, there is a Newton polygon attached to Barsotti tape groups often of defined over fp bar, but then <laughs> height doesn't mean the height of the Newton polygon, so yeah. it's just the terminology. OK, so um, what do I want to say next? Um, I want to define the notion of isogeny. But by the way, maybe I should say this. I mean, this the fact that Multiplication by p is onto is often referred to as p divisible condition. So, hence the name p div divisible groups. Uh, that's, that's why some people prefer to call them that way. Um, okay. So let me explain what it means by a map of partially take groups is isogeny. Well, so you have you know probably the notion of isogeny for abelian varieties, and it's defined basically the same way. Um, isogeny is a surjective map with finite kernel. So, if um, like the uh, i is onto and kernel of i is represented by locally free uh, fin finite group sch scheme. So when I say onto again, it's, well, to be precise, in the sense of shift, FPPF shift, but never mind, it's just, just re use your intuition to understand this condition. So, very easy example is multiplication by p to the m is isogeny. Well, say from sigma to itself is isogeny for all m. But I also want to find the notion of quasi-isogeny. Um, quasi-isogeny. So you can think of it as a fractional isogeny, just like ideal versus fractional ideals in number field is basically isogeny versus quasi-isogeny. So it's a, a quasi-isogeny if j, the actual definition is slightly technical. You look at really fractional isogeny in this way. I mean, this, this home set is actually Z, ZP module, so you can actually tensor with Q, it makes sense. And, and Zariski locally on S, the denominator is finite, it, namely there exists and such that uh, P to the N times J becomes isogeny. So locally, if you multiply P to the N, then actually it belongs to this Homs set, and moreover, it's an isogeny. So, yeah. Uh, in the, in the, uh, 
Uh, uh, what is trivial? Uh, the third uh, line. Yes. Locally on S. Yes, locally on S. Mm. Ah, well, it's. Yes. Um. Yes. Ah, yeah. At, mm. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah, uh, well, yeah. Otherwise, I mean, locally on S doesn't mean, <laughs> it doesn't mean something non-trivial, yes. By underline, I mean the shift, for, shift home of sigma to sigma primed. So, I mean, this arrow is not really the legitimate arrow of shift, but then it's, you're kind of, to get J, you have to modify the notion of morphism in the category of partiality groups. But whatever it means, is something like fractional isogeny. That's an easy way to see it. So again, easy example is um, P to the M. Uh, from G sigma to itself is quasi isogeny for for all integer m it's a quasi isogeny and when it's not negative it's an isogeny okay all right so uh, mm, ah another Um, maybe it's not really example, but um, re maybe remark uh, is that, well, endomorphism is really a ZP algebra. And, well, it's not difficult to see that I only told you how powers of P act on sigma, but in fact, for any element of ZP, you can define an action, natural action on sigma, I and mean, it's an exercise. And it becomes an algebra with over ZP. OK, so our next question is, well, I def gave the notion of partially take groups, but well, they seem quite difficult to study. As, as they are. So there's a nice theory called Dudonet the theory to make them easier. Um, so there are various versions, but I'll just, usually when we say Dudonet the theory, it's over finite fields or FP bar or some perfect field of characteristic P, but, um, but I'll just stick to the case of case over FP bar, I mean partially take groups over FP bar. And there are some similar classification results uh, over other bases. But basically the idea is to understand partially take groups using linear algebra Well, to be more precise, you try to construct the categorical equivalence from the category of possibility take groups over FP bar with some linear algebra category. And basically understanding them amounts to <laughs> doing linear algebra in the other category. So yes, they form a category, but it's not abelian. Because That's right, exactly, that's the problem, yeah. But, but it is a category, just not a billion.
Okay, so Judonet's theory tells you that there is a natural equivalence. I'm not going to construct this here, but basically when you have partially tape groups over FP bar, maybe I'll use round bracket for a category. Um, so there's a, some functor such that the image is something like finite free W modules. So W is uh, the factoring of FP bar. Equipped with F and V action. Well, semi-linear, but whatever. I'm not going to be too precise. Such that FV and VF amounts to just multiplying the element of P of W. So, so there is a, this categorical equivalence. And so you, you can, for instance, compute endomorphism algebra on this category where it becomes an easier problem. OK, so I'll just say one nice consequence. For instance, you can classify facilitate groups over FP bar. And it's especially easier if you consider them up to quasi-isogenies rather than isomorphisms. So there's a Dudonet mounting classification. So if you consider the set of partially tape groups up to quasi-isogeny, then it's in one-to-one -one correspondence with rational numbers between 0 and 1. Uh, yes. So, for instance, QP mod ZP goes to 0, and mu P infinity goes to 1. And this association, maybe I should say something. Um, this association is such that, roughly speaking, uh, roughly speaking, what happens is f to the t is p to the s on the Dudonet module. <laughs> it's not very precise, but I mean, if you write it as a fraction as with two co-prime integers, then basically this is what happens. <laughs> And that's how you associate tiers. Ah, sh I should say irreducible or simple. I forgot that. So, partially t groups which are not isogenous to product of two partially t groups. I mean, those simple partially t groups are in bijection with these rational numbers, and they are classified by rational numbers, so it's really easy. For instance, this guy has slope 0, which means that um, Frobenius basically acts as 1. So Frobenius is an isomorphism on the due name module in this case. And in this, so in this case, due name module of this guy is just W, where F access 1, V access P. And in this case, uh, for Venus access P, V access 1. <laughs> and so that has slope, slope 1. And in general, you can make the same construction to classify these partially take groups. And maybe I'll just say one thing. Um, if, if sigma is, is, is simple and correspond to lambda, then the endomorphism algebra turns out to be central division algebra 
over QP with invariant lambda. That's something. If I tensor it Q, Um, yeah, the endomorphism algebra tensor rate QP turns out to be division algebra. Invariant lambda. So, okay, that's nice. Sorry? It's not central. Not central. Oh, uh, is that right? Uh, I think it is. Uh, mm. Mm. I think it is, but I'll I'll think about it. If I want to be safe, of course, I can just say division algebra. Uh, OK. So it's so much about partially Tate groups. How to, how, how do we define D? Ah, yeah, that's, uh, I'm not going to say anything about that. But. I mean, there is a construction that, yeah, but, <laughs> mm, yeah, you, know, you can discuss after, after the talk. I mean, so, so lots of digression. Um, okay, um, so, yes, I, mm, let me define what proper zinc data. Technically, I'll consider only e, so-called EL type, which means that we don't consider polarization on partially take groups, but never mind. Um, we will set up some, some group theoretic data, and then using this, we will associate a Rappaport zinc space. So, Consider finite extension of QP and a division al finite dimensional division algebra. Over K. And I'll consider finite dimensional vector space. Well, and actually finite dimensional v B module. Maybe I'll say finite generated. Or, yeah, P module. Um, and G will be this GLV as P module. Okay. Um, and what? I consider new. which is a group homomorphism from GM to G, defined, considered over K bar. And eventually, only G conjugate class of mu will matter. Um, and there is a technical condition that, not going to be precise, but weights are zero. In the weight decomposition, basically, mu x on v with weights 0 and 1. Um, mm, OK, and we will all finally with this data, I will consider a partially take group defined over FP bar. And some endomorphism structure. 
of OB into endomorphism algebra of sigma. This is ZP algebra, so it makes sense to consider a map from OB into ZP algebra. So, and such that um, the due domain module is actually OB lattice. And and what? Yes. Of I'll say just I don't have time to make everything precise, so I'll just say that it's of type mu. It's somehow associated with mu. Well, roughly speaking, the Newton polygon well the Hodge polygon of sigma is basically given by mu. That's the condition. Okay, so <laughs> I'll just write one more group J, which appeared in the motivation part, and, and give you a more specific example of this data. So J will be the self-endomorphisms of sigma commuting with this I and I'll take the group of units and I'll view this as algebraic group over QP. I mean, there's a standard way to do it. And G also is an algebraic group, if you like, over QP. Okay, so, so much about uh, that's that's really enough list of data, so let me, yes? So, the is, uh, the oh, I should tensor, tensor QP, yes. So either quasi-isogeny, I mean, one of the two ways, uh, uh, then I don't even uh, need this. Or, if I want this, then I should tensor QP and then take cross. <laughs> yes. Sorry about, sorry about that. Okay. Yeah. So it's, it looks good now. And. I mean, the theory could be as general as this, and actually even more general than this. And there's so-called PL type where it's a little more complicated, where the group can be unitary or symplectic. But in any case, one particular case of this Rapoport zinc data has been very important in proving local elements correspondence for GLN, namely it's the lubin tate case, where where B is equal to K. And for simplicity, I'll just assume that they're even equal to QP. Um, and V is just a, an n-dimensional vector space over K. G is just G or QP. G is GLN. Um, and mu will be chosen to be something like mapping A to A11111 on the diagonal. Um, and sigma is, well, sigma is something. <laughs> Just the partially take group with, o, with QP action, but when QP doesn't mean anything, so it's just height and and slope, it turns out that has slope one over n. Um, and j will be, ah, so I said that the endomorphism algebra will be division algebra with invariant lambda. Um, so in this case, um, it turns out that j is really unit group of division algebra where division algebra is, or well, central division algebra over QP 
with invariant 1 over n. So, and at the end of the day, in the cohomology of Rapoport zinc spaces in this case well, will be acted on by this G and this J. Okay. Um, right, so that's really important to keep in mind. And probably in Yoshida's lecture, you will see more about this case. But my mission is to give the general framework of Rappaport zinc spaces. All right, so I have something like 15 minutes. Um, let's see what I can do. I'll give you a general definition of Rappaport zinc spaces. Um, and all this is similar to what people do in the case of Shimura variety. So if you are familiar with them, then I think you will have less difficulty understanding this. But one thing I forgot to say is to give the definition of E. This is the reflex field in this context. It's just a field of definition. Uh, of G QP bar conjugates class of mu. So whatever it means, it's the analog reflex field in the case of Shimura varieties and it's finite over QP. And sometimes it's equal to K. In this case, Well, E is equal to K if, even without this simplifying hypothesis. So in the Lubin take case, you can basically confuse them. In general, they are different. Um, and then we will basically, the goal is to, if you remember, we, we are looking for a, a vector space equipped with this group action for the vague group over E and this G and J, or maybe GQP and JQP, because I'm viewing them as algebraic groups. So, and to get this, as I said, you will take the cohomology of Rapoport zinc spaces. So now is the time to really define Rapoport zinc spaces from this data. Yes. I was mistaken about this. Ah, <laughs> thank you. All right, so the, here's the moduli problem. We consider the functor, call it M0. Um, so you consider schemes over, well, the completion of the, well, integering of the completion of maximal unlimited extension of E. So if it's confusing, then it's just a, when, when E is QP, it's just a V factor of FP bar, not, nothing more, nothing less. Um, so uh, schemes over this guy in which P is new, locally important. Ah, maybe I'll make it easier by saying P, mm, well, whatever. I was actually going to write down algebra rather than schemes, but never, doesn't matter. Um, so it's a functor associating to each S, a collection of data like X 
uh, x i say rho up to some equivalence. So let me explain what this triple means. Um, so x is partially take group over s, and i is just the OB action on x. Rho is a quasi isogeny from basically sigma to x, but have to make them live over the same base. So what I do is, well, let me just snarkily write S mod PS, by which I mean uh, it's a locus defined by P equals 0 inside S. Um, well, when S is the S is given by an algebra, then it, this means exactly what you think it means. Okay, so this is a quasi isogeny compatible with uh, compatible with OB action. Mm. Okay, so that's the data and there is an obvious notion of equivalence or if there exists an isomorphism of partially take groups commuting with the other data uh, or carrying isomorphism carrying i rho to i prime rho prime then they are considered equivalent and you, so this is really a moduli of partially take groups with, with some extra data and in this story of course I fixed sigma with OB action okay so that's the that's the functor and as usual in this kind of story it is represent, representable by a formal scheme um, so let me say uh, theorem by Rapoport Zinc is um, M0 is representable by a formal scheme over formal scheme associated to this ring. Um, okay. Mm. Now the next step is to give group action. So, so basically, Miata will explain I think we are almost there, but not quite. First, we have this formal scheme. And he will explain, probably today, how to associate this generic fiber I mean, so that it actually lives over this completion of maximal unified extension of E. So this is an attic space. And probably the day of tomorrow or the day after tomorrow, he will explain what, how to play with a tau cohomology, say with compact support. Um, well, to be precise, you take something like uh, compact support cohomology with LID coefficient. <laughs> So that cohomology space is almost what we want. Uh, it's almost by abstract nonsense, you have 
this action of this Galois group, uh, but I don't have enough space. Uh, it's acted on by uh, the Galois group of this guy, uh, this field over that field, which, is, if you think about it, it's exactly the inertia group of E. Um, and there is a way to promote this to action of WE. Again, I don't have time to explain, but there is so-called descent datum, which you can use to define WE action extending this action. So, so you have at least one of the actions. And let me now explain how to define J action on this cohomology. Um, so, so J action. Actually, this is the it could be the easiest in some sense because, well, if you have element of J or JQP, which is the self-quasi-isogeny of sigma, so it acts on the data raw, namely as uh, for this on this moduli data, you just compose with alpha then it's another moduli data. So because J acts on M0, it also acts on this cohomology. Um, maybe I'll just write HC of M0 for this, maybe, or add. Okay. So you have J action. But now, you also want G action. For instance, in the Rubin Tate case, GQP is GLM. So, I mean, that's what you really care about. But it turns out that you can, it doesn't really admit GLM action. I mean, the M0 doesn't admit GLM action. So, you are led, led to consider a tower of, tower of coverings of M0. So that's what you do. Um, I'll be very brief about this. Um, for G action, well, consider tower, or Rappaport zinc tower, as you may call. Um, so, there's really tower parameterized by if if G has like good integral structure, which I will assume, um, you consider all the compact open subgroups of GZP, and for each K, you can associate this uh, covering, which basically um, at the bottom you have. you have this M0, but then for each K, it defines a covering. And of course, the covering extends to infinitely small compact open subgroups. So you have, <laughs> well, tower of attic spaces. And if you take the lim inductive limit of the cohomology of all these guys, then you will get a GQP action, where in one word there's a it's, it's sort of GQP acts on this, just like the Adalic group acts on the tower of Shimura varieties it's, it's through Hackett correspondences. It's the local analog of the, the usual Hackett correspondences on modular curves or Shimura varieties. So, so you have this action. And uh, in the cohomology, 
you, you can make this precise. Namely, a yeah, it's infinite dimensional. It's, yeah. So basically, you take the limit and <laughs> then it will really have this action. <laughs> uh, oh, maybe I'll remember add. It's an ad tower of attic spaces, or if I'm not, if I haven't misunderstood, I mean, the tower projective limit itself is also an attic space. But whatever. You take this cohomology and get this group action. That's the nice effector space I referred to before. And the conjecture, I mean, loosely. Loosely, the conjecture is that subtlety is not literally true, but essentially true when we are in the Lubin Tate case and representations are supercospital. Supercospital for GLN. So. <laughs> I think my time is up, and I'll let others make all this precise. Um, I mean, the construction will be made precise by Professor Mieta, and the living tape case will be investigated in more detail by Professor Yoshida. And I think Tetsuji Ito will also talk about something interesting, maybe about piadic uniformization of Shimura varieties. Anyway, well, thank you. <laughs>